There we go. So this is a, a project I've been working on for a while, and uh, I'm glad I get to have a say today about what I think about what's happening in the inner core. Um, as we've seen, I, I mean, the inner core is a very fascinating place. There's a lot going on, and this is a very rich environment to understand what's happening in the, in the center of our planet. Um, let's see, do I just click? How do I go back if I want to go back? Oh, you can do that. Okay. So here's the conclusion. <laughs> um, so you can, you know, go to sleep now if you like. The, the inner core should not melt congruently, is what I'm going to say, uh, at the inner core boundary. The idea that m melts magically transforms from a 100% solid to a 100% liquid is, it has to be wrong. Uh, melt can percolate out of the inner core. But depleted residual solid is still stuck inside the inner core. You've got to do something with that. It doesn't cross the inner core boundary. Um, any kind of translation mechanism that operates in the inner core has to push the depleted, depleted residual solid away from the upwelling region. This is, uh, and it has, to, it has to produce it and push it away from the upwelling region. Um, depleted residual solid is also relatively dense. It actually could resist uh, this whole process of translation. Um, and it probably limits convection to a single overturn once it uh, sinks to the center of the inner core, if you do have an overturn. And then uh, I can, I'll talk a little bit about how, how convection could be driven, actually, by variations in partial melt content. So this is uh, some figures from Yoshida et al., 1996, JGR paper. It's very well known. Uh, they weren't proposing that the inner core was melting. What they did propose was that it was freezing faster at the equator than at the poles due to the uh, tendencies of flows to uh, have a vorticity aligned with the axis of rotation, the, the Taylor kind of effect. So uh, this would transport heat more efficiently at the equators than at the poles. You get faster freezing at the equators, um, which would deform the inner core, perhaps producing anisotropy that's observed. Uh, more recently, this has gone, um, become much, much more dramatic. Uh, we had two papers in 2010 that proposed uh, translation, more or less rigid body translation of the inner core from a uh, freezing hemisphere to a melting hemisphere. And here we have a liquid becoming solid, it's transiting across the inner core, and then at the inner core boundary becoming 100% liquid again. And these are very similar kind of stories here. Uh, the mechanisms that they talk about are slightly different, but, uh, and then we had this paper by uh, Dave Gubbins, of course, he's, he has to be a part of the party. Um, we have a, a dynamo calculation where he suggests that you could have uh, negative heat flux at certain places, which uh, melts the inner core boundary locally, so that's a, that's a more, it's a somewhat different mechanism. You can play lots of games with this stuff. Uh, Inner core translation can occur without melting the inner core. You can have uh, the case where the velocity of translation is less than the rate of uh, inner core boundary growth, uh, in which case basically you just get an offset. Or it can move faster than inner core boundary growth, in which case you start to remelt bits of core, paleo core, inner core boundaries that uh, translate through and hit the other side. And then you can have variations through time. You can have uh, going from undergrowth to overgrowth or whatever. But is this uh, viable? It's interesting because I, I had been thinking about a similar problem uh, some years ago, but I never imagined that the inner core would melt uh, completely at, uh, at the inner core boundary. Instead, I always thought about it as forming a sort of partial melt in the interior. And so it, it, this is the way I still think about the problem today, and maybe I could convince you that this might be a, a more appropriate way to think about what happens in the inner core. So, of course, here's the simple phase diagram. I think there's one of these in every one of my talks. So you have a liquid region here. You have a solid plus liquid here, solid here. And then you have, on the horizontal axis, the concentration of some light element X, whatever you want it to be, hydrogen, silicon, oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have some region here where the, this uh, light alloy is able to alloy with the uh, 
metal is soluble in the metal. And, uh, and then you have, you know, a liquidus and a solidus, and uh, you know, there's a eutectic, just so everybody's on the same page. So we also have this thing called the lever rule. It's very simple. Basically, it says that if your composition is here and your temperature is here, then the liquid fraction is this. That's this guy divided by the sum of the two. And that's a very simple thing. It's a conservation law. So if you are in this region, then you're in a, uh, a region of coexisting solid and liquid. So the effect of pressure, of course, is to basically uh, change the melting temperature. That's the, the first order effect. As you increase pressure, the melting temperatures go up, the phase diagram shifts up. As you decrease the pressure, it goes down. So this is where I wanted to play with the keyboard a little bit. Um, is it wireless? <coughs> so this is, the, this is the volume effect of melting, basically. Um, you, as you release the pressure, the temperature goes down. So if you have something at a fixed temperature, then it can cross the solidus as the pressure decreases. This is decompression melting. And that's what we usually think about decompression melting in the, in the shallow mantle environment as well. You can also have other things. This has been called the Gubbins effect by some. And uh, basically where the phase diagram is changing form as you change the pressure, um, you could have a change in, for example, the solubility limit of the light alloy at higher pressures, and then a decrease at lower pressures. This is actually quite important for the inner core because if you have an outer core freezing, say, here, and at uh, higher pressures, when the inner core was young, it would have a, a larger amount of X in the solid. And then later on, as you're growing the inner core with the same composition, it would have a smaller amount of X. And so that would cr create the scenario where you would have a composition, a compositional uh, buoyancy instability and in Rayleigh-Taylor overturn of the inner core. So what happens when you cross the, this uh, solidus? Um, there's basically two, two ways you can do this. I know this is all very basic. Some of you, I apologize, but I just want to go through what happens here. There's the batch melting, basically, where you transit the phase diagram vertically. You just go from here to here. You keep all the liquid with you, and you get to 100% melt here. And then there's a fractional melting in member where basically you remove all the melt instantaneously as it's produced and the solid just kind of tracks along here. It always stays at the solidus. More likely in nature you get something intermediate between the two. It starts off close to batch and then once the melt fraction builds up, the melt starts to percolate out and then you start to have more fractional behavior. So what's the difference? Uh, you know, as I said, batch melting occurs in the absence of melt-solid separation. Um, for a batch process to produce 100% melting, it must exceed the liquidus at the bulk composition, that, which is fixed. Uh, fractional style, in order to produce 100% melting, you have to go all the way up to the alloy free end member. If you want to get to 100% melting, you've got to go all the way to this guy, which means you basically have a pure iron nickel metal with all the light elements gone. What's wrong with that picture? Well, Basically, to do either of these things, you have to have something on the order of 700 kelvins. 700 kelvins is about what the eutectic temperature drop is estimated to be for the addition of light elements in the core. Um, it could be slightly different. It could be higher or lower, depending on what the light element is. But it's still pretty large in comparison to the kind of temperature differences available for melting, the remelting the inner core by decompression melting. So, you know, 100K is, is maybe generous if you adopt the new high thermal conductivity values that have been published by uh, Pozzo and uh, Alfe and others. So, how do you get to 100% melting? It just, it seems to be uh, too, too high of a bar to attain. Um, and then we could talk about mechanical stability of a melting column. Um, some point here, you cross the solidus, you have a 0% melt, and then when you get to the liquidus, you have a 100% melt. Um, for smaller melt fractions, you have something like a mush, 
But as you get to larger melt fractions, you'll have a suspension where the grains are no longer touching. Um, in a mush, of course, you can talk about many things like, is the melt buoyant? Are the pore spaces interconnected? Is the matrix compactable? You could discuss the compaction length, where you have uh, some solid viscosity terms on the here, some melt viscosity here, and the Darcy permeability here. All of these having orders of magnitude uncertainty in them. Um, but when you get up to the suspension stage, that's basically the setting velocity. Um, the only way you can keep ba batch melting going is to, uh, well, faster than the Darcy velocity, which of course is not any, anything that uh, we expect to happen. So I would say that uh, just based on these very simple considerations, uh, the simple intercore translation is just not plausible. You, you just can't go from 100% uh, solid to 100% liquid across a thin interface like the intercore boundary. Um, also, I should say seismologically, we don't see a, a thick, mushy transition region anyways. The intercore boundary itself is rather thin, which argues that uh, actually the, the compaction layer might be rather thin itself. So what else can we do? So we have partial melting is quite possible in any of these scenarios. Um, what happens in this case is you actually have to consider uh, that the melt and the solids will move with two different velocity fields, right? The solids will follow one trajectory and the melts will follow another one. For the most part, for a simple percolation, you just expect the melt to escape as it goes between the grain boundaries and go into the outer core. Uh, the solids that are depleted, they're not going to be able to cross that boundary. They're never going to reach the melting temperature. The more you try to do, try to melt them, the more you're going to squeeze out alloy-rich fluid, which is just going to make the melting temperature of the residuum higher. What you have to do is you have to push, to continue this process, you have to push this depleted solid aside. And if you do manage to do that, of course, eventually, this dense solid is going to sink back to the middle, and probably you're only going to get one overturn. This is going to, to stratify the core. So this is as good as you can get, I think, in terms of uh, some sort of inner core dynamics or, or convective overturn. Um, another possibility is that um, this stuff, being partially molten, uh, is more buoyant than this stuff, which is not, and therefore it could actually drive upwelling flow by melt retention buoyancy. This is similar to a mechanism that uh, Dave Stevenson proposed in the 80s to explain uh, volcanism uh, away from plate boundaries and, and non-plume non related volcanism in the shallow mantle. Um, you, I actually went through and did a linear analysis of this and you, I'm not going to show many equations. This is actually the, the maximum number of equations I want to show in a talk. So they're all on one slide. And so you have uh, basically an equation for the perturbation in uh, velocity due to a, a perturbation in melt fraction. This is the harmonic degree, et cetera, et cetera. RP is this uh, non-dimensional number here. It's si kind of like a Rayleigh number. And then there's this guy, which is basically a perturbation to the melt percolation. Um, F0 is this function which basically goes as the derivative of the permeability. And what's happening here, the physics is kind of interesting, is that um, as the melt fraction decreases, the ability for percolation to remove melt from the inner core becomes smaller and smaller because the permeability goes as something like uh, melt fraction squared. So as you get to smaller and smaller melt fractions, then you're going to have um, uh, increase in this value, RP. And when this happens, uh, you're going to cross some minimum critical value, which I calculated to be 56.21471. <laughs> I didn't calculate any more digits than that. And uh, the <laughs> minimum value was attained at uh, L equals 2, harmonic degree 2. Um, the interesting thing is that as the inner core grows, as, as it begins its growth, it'll start as some sort of slurry in a region with no gravity at the center of the Earth. And it has to grow to some size before it starts to compact and push melt out of there, right? And so this, this is actually going to go from uh, zero 
to infinity as the pore spaces close, as the co inner core self compacts, this guy is going to go to zero, that's going to go to infinity. So it will actually cross a critical Rayleigh number at some point. And then there's the conclusions again, and I'll wrap it up with that slide. We have some questions. I told you I didn't have much to say. In your abstract, you had said something to say about the F layer. Do you want to elaborate on that? We have no comments at this time. No. Uh, <laughs> in, in fact, the. Uh, yeah, so the F layer is very interesting. Um, you know, we, we, we've listened to this, uh, there's some talks this morning in the morning session about uh, trying to use equilibrium between the outer core and inner core to constrain the composition of the outer core. But in fact, the F layer changes the game. The outer core may not even be in equilibrium with the inner core because there's this enigmatic layer at, at the bottom of the outer core which appears to be something like it's enriched in uh, iron or depleted in alloys, whichever way you'd like to have it. Um, in any case, um, to produce, you know, I, I don't think that you can remelt the core and make the F layer. That was basically what I was going to say. And therefore, that the F layer is a primordial feature. That some, for some reason, uh, this mixing event in the core at the beginning of, of Earth's uh, history, after the giant impact, somehow just didn't mix the whole thing completely. You ended up with some iron-rich region in the middle, and the inner core has been growing inside of that the whole time. And what we see as the F layer is the remains of that, the, the, the residual iron-rich stuff. So that's, that's the, in a nutshell what I was going to say. Are there any more questions? In that case, let's thank John again. Thanks.